What's up, everybody? Wait for Paul to get in here. Send some tweets out. All right. Is Paul on here? Paul is on here. Here. <clears throat> What's up, Paul? Rick, how are we doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Try to get Baum in here, but he's got a meeting. Yeah, come on. I know. That's what I said. Trust One me, that's second, what... he's on the message board posting about sitting next to you eating Chipotle. The next second, he's got real work to do. I'm not buying. I know. No, I know. I, that's what I said. That's what hey, I Paula. said. Paula. All right, let's see. Oh, uh, 135 people in here. Did we? Oh, you're. We're already live. Oh yeah, we're live, baby. Uh oh. All right. Well, what'd you say? Well, nothing. Did I do just, a nip slip. No, let's, I'm just Poppy making top. sure. Yeah, tarps off. Uh, Popcorn are we Sutton. On... Do you know Brett Sutton? I went to a uh, school with a Brett Sutton when I was growing up. He's a cool guy. Um, we are on. Uh, let's go. Paul, uh, you just got posted in the Discord, your face. Mine? You just got posted <laughs> in the Discord. Yeah, that's a great picture of me. It is a good picture of you. Uh, all right. I'm good. I'm good whenever you're good. I'm good. Let's do it. All right. Let's rock and roll. Welcome into another episode of the Musketeer Report podcast. It is April 16th, and it is the height of the transfer portal season. Now, Rick and I planned this show, assuming that we would have no news today, and we thought this would be a good good day to do the show, which probably means that Rick has four impact articles that he's going to have to write on the spot here coming up the rest of the day, because uh, that's just how this goes sometimes. But to be clear, I do but, not right now. I do not have any impact articles written, and we're not expecting any you, no, news on the show, just to be clear. No, we're... We're certainly not, but because we're live, that's just how this business rolls sometimes. So what we're going to do is we're going to spend uh, the next you know, 45 minutes to an hour, however long the show goes. If anybody in here has questions, we're happy to answer them. I'll be firing off a bunch of questions that I have for Rick just as we get through the portal. But uh, to, to lay the foundation for this, Rick, to start things off, it's been a while since we podcasted. So let's just kind of catch up on where we are in the portal um, I know that's a broad question and you've done a, a million posts on the message board and that's a, where a lot of this information is. But do you want to just kind of set the stage here? Yeah. Uh, first of all, 60% off sale going on right now. Transfer Portal Palooza. It's full blown. Uh, Paul, I think you can attest to this, even though we've lost you to the Discord. You used to be a Musketeer Report guy. You used to comment yeah. on there. Um, <laughs> I think you'll agree that there's been as much information, as much stuff going on there as we've ever had in the history of Musketeer Report. So uh, it is a good time to sign up right now. 60% off. Please do that. If you like Xavier content, if you want something to populate the Discord with, you want something to talk about there, you're going to need the site around. Like we're we're going to be gone tomorrow if you guys keep going the way you're going. So uh, please help us out there. 60% off sale. Make sure you sign up for Musketeer Report. Uh, but yeah, Paul, I think the first thing is just maybe, I know a lot of people are very online right now and they're in the Discord every day. They're on Musketeer Report every day. Shout out to those people. I, I, we need you. We love you. But there's also a lot of people who don't have the time to be in it every single day. And it's like hard to keep up with all of this stuff. So for the first group of people, some of this may be a little bit slow initially. We're going to try to reset things, get everyone caught up to speed, and then we'll get into answering all your questions, get into the nitty-gritty of what's going on over the last few days and what's ahead the rest of the week. Um, first of all, seven players are in the transfer portal from Xavier. I think most of you know that by now. you got Kraft, Enze, Shani, Usman, Namiksha, Ducharme, and Djokovic. Those are the seven guys that have entered the portal. Kraft is already committed to Miami of Ohio. NZ is committed to Penn State, and Djokovic has committed to College of Charleston. So two of the three guys that already committed, 
will be playing for former Xavier coaches, which is uh, kind of funny. Paul, were, were you, uh, are you excited to see Lazar Djokovic playing for Chris Mack? I'm telling you, I'm a huge Cougar fan. I'm a massive Cougar fan this coming season. There's no doubt about it. I actually had a friend uh, who, who might be listening to this called me and said he was going to Charleston and he was going to pick up a hoodie. And I told him, get me a large too. Yeah, I'm, I'm all in. That's I'm, to, But again, you know, going speaking to Lazar and, and that, it feels like that's probably a good type of fit for him. I think our question was whether he was just going to go home or what the, what the internationals were going to do. Were they going to stay in the States and play again and transfer to a different school or were they just going to go home and play, you know, in their native countries? I was a little surprised. I, I didn't really have any inside information. I just kind of figured that that was the way they were going to go. But I'm sure that, you know, for, for Lazar, that's a good fit for him. We need Lazar to figure it out. We need him to start playing well because him playing with Chris Mack, some of the things Mack will do with him, the creativity on the offensive end, that could be fun to watch. And it is kind of this, you know, this unique thing we're in now with the way the transfer portal works and the way NIL works, where it's like, okay, if it's not working out for you initially at the high major level, going down to the mid major level, putting up some numbers and getting your value up again so you can go back to the high major level potentially and make good money again is actually a really good route for these players. So I think Lazar is, is making a smart decision here. Not to get off on too much of a tangent on the College of Charleston, but we haven't podcasted since then. So just to, to get this out of the way at the beginning, it, it, Charleston is not officially going to the A-10, right? Because I've seen a lot of people talking about that. I There's nothing going on that they are going, but that's what they've constantly been rumored that maybe they'd be the UMass replacement. I, I'd be full on lying to you if I said I had followed College of Charleston, the A10, and conference realignment at that level in any way, shape, or form. I am locked okay. in on the on the Big East and Xavier's transfer portal right now. So I, I honestly do not okay. know. Um, I just heard so many rumors about it. I didn't know if I was on, I because I'm the same way. I just was trying to at least keep up with it. But um, yeah. Uh, all right. So, so back to where we were. They've have added. Yep. They got seven guys in the portal. They have added one commitment so far, and that is Furman Wing Marcus Foster, who we've talked about already. Still on the roster from last year. Zach Fremantle. Jerome Hunter, Davion McKnight, Desmond Claude, still on that roster. Trey Green, still on that roster. And Dalen Swain. Um, and then also you have freshman wing Jonathan Powell, who will be joining the team this summer. So that's where the roster is at. Before we move on, probably the Desmond Claude situation is what we need to address first in terms of news this week. But before we move on, Paul, is there anything there about the current roster, where we're at in this whole roster reset that, that needs to no, be addressed I, in your opinion? I, I, I don't think so. I think the guys that transferred out probably be good fits. Kachienze going back a little closer to home, being from Pennsylvania. Cam Kraft, that felt like a very natural fit to go right up the road to Miami. And then for Lazar to go to College of Charleston, I don't think there's any surprises there. Um, but I, I think obviously the first thing that we're going to talk about here is the Desmond Claude situation. And uh, to talk about the message board, the great Charles Bronson had a post on the message board um, that I will kind of tease here that I don't think I could have more perfectly summed up my position on the Des Claude situation than that post last night. And I don't know what thread that was in. I think it was just in the in the general portal thread, or it might have been in, under the I think it Instagram might be the Desmond post. Claude. I think it might be the Desmond Claude post at the top of Musketeer Report right okay. now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, wherever that was, it had a million upvotes, so it wouldn't be hard to find. But that post pretty perfectly summed up what I kind of feel like with this whole situation going on. I would agree. I upvoted that post by uh, the great Charles Bronson, who always comes in with insightful stuff and adds really good yeah. information or just thoughts on a matter. And I think in this case, it was kind of the latter. I, I don't think he has any inside information about what's going on right now with Desmond Claude, but rather he's just sort of viewing this with, with a good head on his shoulders and kind of reading the tea leaves a bit. And I would tend to agree that out of all the things I've seen online this week, and I've seen a lot of stuff from different people who are crushing whether it be uh, you know Desmond or his family or the coaching staff and all these different people who are at fault in this situation, almost all of those things I've read, I would not agree with. Charles Bronson's is the closest thing that I've seen. And I guess the point of that is ultimately that I don't think there's some big thing of like Desmond Claude doesn't want to be at Xavier or he doesn't want to play at Xavier. I think he'll be just fine coming back to Xavier and playing basketball there next year. I also think there's probably some agents and other people who have gotten involved in his circle right now who are trying to prove their worth and are trying to make something happen for him and find him maybe a better situation or telling him they can find him a better situation. Um, at this point, you know, there were a lot of people last week who were saying there's an ultimatum 
Desmond Claude's going to, he's got a deadline. He's either going to have to make a decision by Friday or he's gone. That was never the case. Now I did think we would hear of uh, an answer of what he was going to do by last Friday or Saturday, by the end of the last week after the, the dead period ended. That didn't happen though. There was never some crazy ultimatum or deadline that was given out. I know some fans really want that to be the case every time a guy might be entering the portal. It's just not really how these situations work. Um, but there is definitely something there to all this Des confusion and the rumors and the rumblings around it. It doesn't mean he's definitely gone. I would also say the fact that he hasn't entered the portal yet doesn't mean there's nothing to those rumors. There's definitely something going on here. And at this point, I think we're all just kind of waiting to hear what does his final answer is going to be. And, and I'll tell you, I mean, I've been tracking this every day. I talked to people all day yesterday on the phone and everyone that I thought either, whether they were from Xavier or not, I thought if they had any chance that they would know something about Desmond Claude, I asked them, what, what, what do you think is going on there? Have you heard anything? Paul, the answers were all across the board. No one has a clue what's going Nobody on. Nobody knows. And, and to be honest, I'm not sure Des knows. That, well, I think that's the issue. That's what usually happens. When, when you get answers that are all across the board and no one really has a, has a real answer, the case is typically that there is no answer to be had because the source themselves doesn't have an answer yet. And the transfer portal closes on May 1st, but as somebody pointed out on the message board, there is always the opposite because everybody's saying, oh, well, at the worst case scenario, we only have to wait two more weeks. Well, yeah, except he could go in the portal on the last day of April and then leave open the option to coming back to Xavier. And then this just keeps going on. Do I, I, I anticipate that? I, I can't imagine I it goes that long. I, I don't think so. I don't think so either. Yeah. Just to be clear, I don't think so. But as this has dragged on, we also thought this might be resolved a week or 10 days ago. Des will make an announcement at some point. I, I'm not going off of inside information there. There's just no way that this can linger and linger. And then the Zach Fremantle happens where he just keeps showing up. That's not going to happen. Yeah. There will be some kind of a decision one way or the other. That's what I've been telling people. I just cannot see a way. I will tell you this. You, you have my word on this. If Xavier tries to go through this and just act like, oh yeah, Desmond was coming back the entire time. We're not going to put out a statement. We don't need to. You, I will promise you, I will raise hell about that. I will, I will make them make some type of statement about this because we all want to know. They've all been floating this stuff out there, leaking information about it throughout the last month plus. And that's why it's been a public thing. So we will get some type of answer here on the Desmond thing. And I don't think... You know, we'll get to the last day of the transfer portal. He'll enter, and then we'll have to wait longer to find out. I, I think it'll be resolved within the, the coming days, but I'd be lying to you if I said I had a, a good feeling about which way it's going to go right now. Johnny comes in with a question. Is the understanding with Claude that if one of these mystery schools wants him, he'll definitely go? Now, the, the one way to answer that question is the thing that I, I guess has been reported or that has been talked about a lot is Desmond or his camp and their desire for him to play point guard somewhere. Rick, what do you know about that? I think that's overblown. I keep seeing people bring that up. I don't think that's the biggest deal here. I don't think that's what all this is about. Um, okay. Now, I, I obviously, people have talked about UConn and them being a school. And, and UConn makes sense for two reasons. One, he's from there. And two, they had their season just end. So it made sense that like that's why this is being dragged out because he's waiting for a team like Alabama or UConn, two of the teams that were mentioned as possibly being interested in him. But you know, I would tell you right now, just from kind of looking at where UConn's at and what they're trying to do. I, I'm not sure that there's really an offer on the table for him to go to UConn, or at least one that's going to be better than what he's getting from Xavier. So uh, I don't have a specific school in mind right now about where he's definitely going to end up if he were to leave. And as far as Johnny's question, I don't think that's the case. I don't think the understanding is, is that if one of these schools want him, then he's definitely gone because Xavier has a pretty good opportunity waiting for Desmond Claude. He's, he's already made a significant jump under one year of playing for Sean Miller. From freshman to sophomore year, he got a lot better. Sean Miller's system has already proven to be very beneficial for guards to play in, to put up big numbers, the amount of possessions you get every game, the amount of shots they get up. It's good if you want to put up numbers as a guard, especially, especially as a guard who likes to play fast, needs to get out in transition, and isn't great in the half court which I think we saw from this year, Desmond is clearly going to be better when he's able to get fouled, get into open space, use his athleticism, as opposed to being bogged down in the half court where there's not enough room for him to operate. So uh, all of that combined with Xavier being in a pretty good spot NIL-wise means that whoever is going to come in and take Desmond away, if they do that, is going to have to put a really good offer on the table. So to yeah. answer Johnny's question, I don't think that's the case at all. Yep. Um, okay. Uh 
Rick, anything else here before we move on from Des Claude? Because that's obviously the biggest topic that everybody wants to talk about. Um, are there is there anything else you feel like that's noteworthy? I know a lot of a lot of things have been thrown around and a lot of it hasn't been true. Um, but anything else that you feel like is worth mentioning? Not necessarily with Des specific, but I think two things that we should probably do is talk about are there any other players leaving in addition to Des? Could there be anybody else leaving? And then also go on to the backcourt from here of like, how do they look at putting together the backcourt with the idea that things with Des could be uncertain right now? Because I think that's what a lot of fans are worried about is like Des is putting Xavier in this precarious spot where they don't, they're waiting on him and they can't move forward in the transfer portal. And that's just not the case. So I think let's start there. I, I think the, the idea here is that Desmond Claude, it, it's not exactly like this, but I, I wrote this on the message board. I think a good way to look at this right now is Desmond Claude is almost like one of the other transfer portal recruits, meaning Xavier is recruiting the guys they want. Desmond Claude is included, included in that group. They might, they'd love to have Desmond back. He would be a nice addition in that backcourt, but they've also got three, four other guards that they're looking at. They're bringing them in on visits this week. We're going to talk about them. Obviously, they just had one of them in Ryan Conwell. They've got another one coming up in Dante Maddox, who I think are two of their top targets in the transfer portal right now. I don't think Xavier would have any hesitations about trying to take commitments from both of those guys. So this idea that like they're being held up by Desmond Claude just isn't the case right now. I, I don't think that that is really true. And I think the way they view it is they want to add definitely a, a starting level backcourt player to the mix. But I think you could look at adding potentially two really good backcourt players and especially shooters to pair with Dez to give him more room to operate. That does, like if you add the two guys we're talking about, Conwell and Maddox, and you bring back Dez, those are like perfect compliments. Those are guys that would play really well together. Those are the type of backcourt players that make your offense scary, dangerous, Big East yep. level, top half of the Big East level. This is the type of point they're trying to get to. So the idea that you might be like having too many good guards in your backcourt all of a sudden, that's not a concern for Xavier right now. That That is the spot that they are trying to get to. I'm not saying it's going to be easy to have all three of those guys. That's probably unlikely that they'll be able to get commitments from both of their top targets and bring Des back. But if they could, I think they'd love to do that. Uh, just to double back while you were making that point, I went back and found it on the message board. The Bronson post that we were talking about was from the first page of the Desmond Claude posts on Instagram thread. Uh, from the message board. So if anybody's listening and wants to go find that, that's where you can go and read it. Um, okay. As far as other players that might leave, uh, we saw that Zach Fremantle and I, we all anticipated Fremantle would come back, but uh, officially John Rostein reported it last week. He'll be back. Uh, we're all assuming know that Jerome Hunter will be back next year. So really the only other two, uh, unless I'm forgetting somebody, Rick, would be Dalen Swain and Trey Green. And to me, it feels like Trey Green is the one that's up in the air here because his position is currently in a in a portal battle right now. Yeah, and I think that's the exact way to read this right now. The only other guy that I would look at as ha having the potential to enter the portal still would be Trey Green. Now, I think he plans on coming back right now, but you also look at kind of the way the recruiting's going. They're clearly looking at adding more guards. The Desmond Claude thing is still up in the air. Could I see a situation where Desmond announces he's coming back, Xavier gets a commitment from one of these guards in the portal, and now Trey Green is looking at his role for next year and says, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to play the minutes that I want to play, and now he's looking elsewhere. I could definitely see that being a possibility. So we don't know what's going to happen with that yet, but there were rumors a few weeks ago about Trey Green potentially looking at the portal. Nothing has been said one way or the other. I think most people believe that right now he's on the track of of coming back. But again, I think that could definitely change. Um, all right, let's keep going with the portal. And once we finish with the portal, I do have a few other uh, college basketball topics to get to. Yeah. So we're going to get to all of that here on the show. But go ahead, Rick. And also, let me just say, like we're we're seeing your comments here. We can we can see all of them. We are yes. doing a podcast first show. This isn't like your typical YouTube live stream where we're just going to yeah. talk about all your comments as they come in. We're not ignoring you guys. If you have a relevant question about what we're talking about, I will see that. I will pop it up on screen. We'll talk about it. Otherwise, we'll get to a bunch of the random questions at the end where I'll address all yep. those at the time. But understand that some of these people are going to be driving around in their car just listening. So if we're like just randomly saying, hey, Johnny, hey, Brett, hey, what, whoever, it's going to be confusing to listen to. So we're trying to do a podcast first show, but we will take your questions as well. 
All right, let's get into the the portal targets right now. And the first one I want to start with uh, is I, John Hugley. Um, and I'm I Hugley, went into yeah. the. You sure it's Hugh? I th- I thought it was Hugley. I want to is it Hugley? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hugley. Uh, Hugley seems like the closest potential commitment to Xavier right now. Uh, Rick, I want you to convince me on his fit at Xavier. Um. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. Where, where, where did we just go now? Where we just skipped a, a bunch of spots. Uh, I thought we were talking about the backcourt. Oh, do you want to? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Let's talk about the backcourt since we're talking about all, all right. that stuff. We'll get we'll, we'll right, get to right, it right, right. because we have brought up Dante Maddox and um and okay. also Ryan Conwell. Sure. So right. let's talk about those backcourt guys for a minute. Um, okay. I think, like we were just saying, I think they could still bring in two more. Uh, Paul, do you have any questions? Obviously. We mentioned Ryan Conwell visited Sunday and Monday, wrapped up the visit yesterday. Dante Maddox is coming in Wednesday for a visit. I'm not sure exactly when he arrived. He might arrive Tuesday night and start that visit Wednesday, or he might arrive on Wednesday. I was just told Wednesday was his visit. Um, and then there are a couple of other guys out there um, with Dakota LaFue, Jalen Leach, maybe another name or two. Um, Anthony Del Orso is another name that we've heard that was on the radar last year during the transfer portal. Uh do you have any questions, any thoughts about any of those guys that are? Well, LaFue LaFue played for Dan Engelstad, who was the coach at Mount St. Mary's. He's now the assistant head coach or maybe the associate head coach up at Syracuse. I don't know if that's where he's going to commit, but that's certainly something to keep an eye on. Um, as far as the rest of those guys go, why don't we talk about the two guys that could potentially end up at Xavier? It seems like the, the most realistic targets right now in Maddox and Conwell. Uh, I texted you as soon as Conwell popped on the radar a few days ago and I, I am very excited about the opportunity to watch him in his Xavier uniform. Now, it was reported earlier, either today or last night, that Ohio State is going to make a big, big push for him. He will visit Ohio State later on in the week. He was never going to commit before that Ohio State visit. He wants to take all the visits. So it's not like Xavier had him on the visit this week and he didn't commit, and that's a bad sign. This was always the plan. But he's going to visit Ohio State. To me, Rick, a, a 41% three-point shooter, the way he could score, what he did as the second leading scorer on Indiana State. You get Ryan Conwell and you start mixing in this backcourt. Maybe Des Claude comes back and you add one more piece. You're talking about a, a really legitimate Xavier team for next year. Well, if you've listened to us doing this podcast the last few seasons, you've probably gotten tired of hearing me say Xavier has a lack of shooting. They need more shooting. They can never have enough shooting. Um, I have just felt for a long time that Xavier has not been able to hit on these wing shooters that they ch- they've tried to recruit, and it's left them seemingly every year with a shooting deficiency. And so, adding a guy like Ryan Con- Conwell, in my opinion, is exactly what this roster needs. Not because of Ryan Conwell, the specific player, although I do think he's good, but getting a guy that is a bona fide sharpshooter from the outside. A la like a, a Quincy Oliveri filled that role. I think you need more guys like that. And um, Ryan Conwell is that type of player. As you mentioned, he is a big time three point shooter on a lot of volume. And I think the biggest thing that when I look at Paul is he is an elite spot up guy. So like you, you look at him and his role at Indiana State, he's their second most used offensive player behind their big man that, that went viral, Robbie Avila. And he became... Uh, Conwell kind of became the the Batman to him, but that still means if you're the guard, you're getting a lot of touches, a lot of shots up. You're having to create a lot of stuff. If he goes to a team at the Big East level where he's not maybe the main creator, and he is more of a in more of a spot up role where he's going to be able to knock down open shots and also attack long closeouts because the defense is going to be trying to recover to him, I think he could be really, really effective based on how efficient he was in spot up possessions last year. So that is one guy that I think really fits in well. And based on what I've heard coming out of his visit, I think that was the vibe coming from the visit too, that he and his family are are a great fit for Xavier. And, and uh, that would be one that they would like to wrap up. I I would be thrilled for that one. Okay. Let's talk about uh, Maddox. Yeah, I think kind of similar in the sense that a good outside shooter, both of these guys can play with the ball in their hands. Conwell and Maddox are both comfortable doing kind of the combo guard thing. They're definitely more scorers than they are point guards, but they they've played as the point guard at times where they've, they've been the main creator and, and coming off of ball screens and all of that stuff. Maddox to me is a little bit more of a driver and playmaker than Conwell. Conwell is, is a better spot up guy 
And Maddox is a good spot up guy, but a little bit better at some of the other stuff, making his own shot, making some plays and being more of a kind of combo guard ish guy. Um, but, but both of them, I think really fit what you're trying to add here, which is scores, but bona fide shooters to go alongside Davion McKnight and potentially Desmond Claude. Okay. Um, all right. Let's talk about some of the other guys that Xavier hasn't been as closely tied to Delorso. Let's start with him. Yeah, I think with Delorso, it, you really get into looking, especially if like Claude does enter the portal, then Del Orso gives you that length and creativity that can be multiple spots, kind of a guard, but also can slide down to the wing more because he has that size. So um, he is a guy that there hasn't been a lot of information out there yet on where his recruitment is headed, but that's a name I would keep an eye on because Xavier clearly has a connection. They were very involved in his recruitment last year before he decided to stay at Campbell. And I, I think that's a name that it's not real hot right now this week, but it could heat up quickly here as we get towards the weekend and into next week. Um, okay, keep going. I'm trying to think well, if there's any other. Name. Yeah, I, th I think that's good for the guards. I think, um, okay. you know, uh, right now this week, the main focus is going to be on what's going to happen with Conwell and Maddox. And you kind of play off it from there. Now, that's not to say there won't be other guards coming in on visits, because like I said, Leach originally had a visit and so did Dakota Lefeu. Uh, I'm going to follow up on those guys today and tomorrow to see if they'll be make if they'll be coming into campus still. One note on Jalen Leach, the guard from Fairfield, another shooter. He's really close with Zach Fremantle. In fact, I had one source tell me the lead recruiter for Jalen Leach is Zach Fremantle. <laughs> um, <laughs> so they they played together at Bergen Catholic. They have a, a pre pre established relationship there. So um, that's another name to maybe keep an eye on that could fall into to place if things work out over the next week. Um, I think that's pretty good for the guards. Those are the main guys to focus on. Uh, Maddox, you're, you're looking at still Illinois and Louisville as the two main competitors. We talked about with Conwell. It sounds like he's had to do Ohio State next. So we'll see what happens with that. And we'll continue to update you on the, the premium message board at musketeerreport.com if anything changes on those guys. Before we get to the front court, I was going to tweet this the other night. It's sitting in the drafts. The, the transfer portal right now in college basketball I think in general, it's a bad thing for the casual fan because it's really hard for roster retention, trying to follow guys. You get a ta part of the pageantry of college basketball is you you follow somebody as a freshman, they mature as a senior. You know, it, it's it's the fun that you follow them for four years. But I think both things can be true. It's a negative from that perspective, but it is also infinitely more entertaining and involved to follow this right now than to follow high school recruiting throughout the summer. I mean, to me, following the high school recruiting, was it was always hard. There's a million names. Targets come here and there, and you're thinking to yourself, okay, well, I follow somebody that is going to commit, and I might not get to know them for another two or three years, depending on what class they're in. You're talking about a, a five-week stretch here of impact players that are going to be on your team next year, and you can follow immediately. And I think... Uh, Oh, well, yeah, there you go. To your point, there's your post from the message board. I, I think that's spot on. I, I totally agree with you, Paul. I, I, I'm i a little bummed out about this right now. I'm a little bummed out about the way the discourse is going because I get it. It's It stinks that some of your favorite players could leave and it's tough to keep track of all this stuff sometimes. It's hard to, to buy into like, oh, this guy's a freshman. He's going to develop over four years. But this is way more interesting to follow there are reasons that these guys are going like some of these guys are making bad decisions as freshmen going to the wrong school for whatever reason because of glitz or glamour they it's more high profile and then they're actually finding a better fit or going to going somewhere where they have a better relationship with a staff or something the second time around sometimes it's only about money and about play but some of these guys are really you know creating better situations for themselves and it's just more interesting to follow we're also not asking like what 17 year olds are going to be doing a year and a half from now. It's like, no, what are you backup player in the ACC going to be doing next season where you're either impacting this Big East team or you're going to some other high major team and, and impacting them. That's just far more interesting. And, and it has way more of a relevancy to what we're talking about right here. It just stinks that every conversation right now is this is ruining the sport. This sucks. I can't follow any of this. A, a lot of whining. I, I fans like to yeah. whine a lot, and I wish like we could get past that and talk about the crazy roster movement that we're seeing and all the fun parts of it. Yeah, I agree. I, I think you. I try to put myself sometimes in in the fan that tunes in. You know, starts maybe paying attention in 
mid-October where, all right, let's catch up on the roster and what happened. And then all of a sudden you realize that the entire roster is new year over year. I can see where that would be frustrating for somebody that's trying to pay attention during the NFL and the end of Major League Baseball and everything else. But for us that are in this every day and paying attention to every move that everybody makes, it is wildly more entertaining than trying to follow the random AAU tournaments that are going on all over the country. Yeah. Tony, um, you, Tony says, when talking about transfers, can you mention the number of remaining seasons? We'll try to do a better job of that. There's there's a lot of information, and we're trying to recite things off the top of our heads. I don't know if I'll remember every guy's eligibility status right off the top. But uh, also, Tony, it doesn't matter. Like They're all on one-year deals right now. It's free agency every year. They come here for a year. They might be gone the next year. I don't think any of these staffs are looking like, some guys, they'll say, hey, this guy has one year left. This guy has two. Maybe we'll get two out of them. But with a lot of these guys, you're looking at it as we've got them for one year, and then we'll figure out next year, next year. So um, I know a lot of fans are worried about the eligibility, but it's the the importance of how many years you have left has, has gone out the window a little bit. Yep. Um, all right, let's get back to the front court. And we talked about uh, Hughley. I pitched that a few minutes ago. Let's get back to him. Yeah, so John Hughley is the transfer from Oklahoma, played at Pittsburgh, had a really good sophomore year at Pittsburgh, and then the next year he had an injury before the season, never returned. It was like a weird thing all year. They kept seeing like, when is he going to be back? You know, media would be asking uh, Capel, when is he going to be back? Capel would be like, we're not sure. Um, and then after a while, midway through the season, he eventually put out a release saying, I'm dealing with mental health issues and uh, an injury, so I'm, I'm not coming back. I'm just skipping this year. Then he transferred to Oklahoma. He was very heavy this year at Oklahoma, came off the bench, didn't have nearly as good of a year as he did two years ago, his sophomore year at Pittsburgh. And um, then he ended up missing the last month of the season with a meniscus injury. So he is he was on campus this week, but there are obvious concerns there with a guy who hasn't really performed at his peak level in two years um, and has missed time with injuries each of the last two seasons. So I definitely think there are some things there to be sorted out and figure, figured out. That's why you bring a guy on a visit. You sit down with him, you talk to him, you, you see how he's doing and, and see if it's a fit. So I've seen the discourse on Discord and on our message board there today about John Hughley. And the real answer is we don't know yet. He is still wrapping up his visit. Uh, there are there are reasons to be concerned. They're, they're looking into those things right now. There's also reasons to think Xavier needs a guy they can throw the ball into on the offensive end that can actually give them a post presence. And that's what John Hughley did when he was at his best two years ago at Pittsburgh. And that's what they think he can still potentially do. That's why he's on a visit. So uh, he has a, a visit to Nebraska scheduled for the end of the week and end of the weekend. I'm not sure what will happen with that. There's he might take that to Nebraska. There's also a chance he could make a decision before that. Um, hopefully we'll know a little bit more in the next day or two. Elsewhere around the front court, Zach Fremantle's coming back. You're hoping that Jerome Hunter is healthy and able to play at the majority of the season next year. But again, I don't get the sense that this coaching staff is uh I don't get the sense that they are going to necessarily put all their eggs in one basket on Zach Fremantle and Jerome Hunter, knowing that Zach is coming off multiple foot surgeries, Jerome Hunter is coming off everything that he's been through. It's not fair to them to put the weight of the team on both of them when they haven't played competitive basketball in two seasons. Yeah. And you know, that's an interesting question too, because we've seen them so far in the portal reach out to a lot of centers, but there have also been forwards. I mean, Jair Davis was one. He just committed to Syracuse, and it seemed like things had tailed off there. But um, R.J. Godfrey from Clemson, they just recently reached out to. And maybe you look at him at 6'8", 225, 230-ish, and you think he's more of a center. But I think he'd probably tell you he's more of a four. So um, it's interesting to see. Like, do they do they feel like maybe they could bring in a forward if it's the – I think would have to be the perfect fit there. Um, my opinion is I think you bring in two centers. Because if you bring in a forward, then the idea is that you're probably sliding Zach Fremantle down to the center at times. And you're going into the season with that intention. I'm not saying that you won't ever slide Zach Fremantle down to the center spot or that you should never do that. But I don't think going in with that intention makes you your strongest. I think Zach yep. is clearly best as a power forward. And playing alongside someone who can do the defensive job next to him as the center, that helps him out a lot. So I think going into the season with that mindset is coming in with a, a, a mindset of strength, you know, playing from a position of strength as opposed to let's see how we can finagle this to put us at kind of a disadvantage, but maybe it still works. 
Uh, so I would lean towards two centers, not a forward and a center. But I definitely think they're going to get multiple front court guys. Michael and Waco and Woco uh, from Woco, yeah. my from Miami. Uh, 6'10", 245, listed as a center. Any update on him? Um, yeah. He's, so, I mean, not not much news, but that is a guy that Xavier is very much in there with. And I think it's all about timing with some of these things. You know, it, it, there are other... Hughley's on a visit right now. There are other big, man, big men that they are interested in the portal. I think right now they feel like they're in a good spot with Nwoko. So you kind of play a little bit of this out and go from there, but it would not surprise me at all if Michael Nwoko ended up committing to Xavier. I think they're in a really good spot there, and I don't know who the biggest competition is right now or or where he might, where else he might be looking at. I just want to say as an aside uh, off the recruiting side of this, I I just want to say this. I tweeted this the other day when uh, Zach was, when when they announced that Zach was coming back and the coaching staff, if anybody's listening to this, they might disagree. I'm not having those same conversations with Zach that, that they are obviously every day, but I noticed a very different Zach Fremantle over the last month to two months that he was back around the team. Zach's gotten criticized a lot by fans and, and people for immaturity and for some of the decisions that he's made over the years. And we saw him, he was suspended in his first, what, week on the job with, with Sean Miller and trying to set a tone there. I noticed a very different Zach Fremantle, just personality-wise, leadership, practice, what he was when he was coming back, um, that made me really excited to watch him next year. I, I think, uh, you know, hopefully that translates through the offseason and we get a fully healthy Zach Fremantle next year. But just... I, I noticed a lot of things that made me very encouraged about him being able to go into next season healthy as a leader of this team, somebody that wants to get to the NCAA tournament and play in it for the first time, actually, as a player. Uh, I, I was really impressed just by some of the things that I heard from people around the program, talking to other players, trying to help establish this roster for next year and and make sure that guys are encouraged going into the season. Um, I just wanted to throw that in there because I, I I think Zach has been criticized over the years for some things, some things maybe rightly so, some things maybe unfairly so, and I, I just hope that Zach continues that into next year because it, it was fun to watch over the last couple of months once he was cleared. And I would also say he looks good physically too, which is yeah. a good thing. And I know everyone's curious about. He did, you know, January I think is when he first got back into the mix doing some non-contact stuff with the team, but yeah. by the end of the year, he was full blown practicing and like yeah. he's he's back. I mean, he, he looks good. So, um, I don't know. You know, I know people are like, oh, how, how much was he scoring? Was he dominating guys one on one? Yeah, sure. Like it was practice. I don't know. I mean, you know, who knows what it means, but he looked good. He, he definitely looked good. So, I think that's uh, that's a good sign for certain. Um, just to wrap this up on t- in terms of shaping the front court going forward, like is there a top target at the in the front court right now in the transfer portal? I don't know if I would frame it that way. I think that the main guys to keep your focus on for now are Michael Nwoko, John Hughley, and then a- another name that we've talked a lot about on the message board that I just haven't exactly figured out what's going on with him yet is Brandon Garrison, the Oklahoma State transfer. A lot of people thought he was going to go to Oklahoma. He took his visit there. He hasn't committed there yet. Um, Texas is also in the mix. They're trying to bring him in on a visit. I talked to a Texas source yesterday. He said, Something seems to be going on there. I'm not sure what's happening. So that kind of lends leads me to believe either he could be considering going back to Oklahoma State maybe, and maybe he's kind of like going dark a little bit coming off the board, or maybe there's a dark horse candidate out there that's more involved with him than those schools that are closer to him realize. I know Xavier has been involved with him, and I know they're trying to bring him in on a visit. So Brandon Garrison, the Oklahoma State big man, is another big guy that I definitely have on my radar um, I'm trying to think if there's anyone else for right now in terms of front court targets. I think I'm that's it. To, yeah, yeah, we're talking about all the Musketeer report every minute, it seems like. So uh, if I'm missing them, would definitely you can ask me there on the message board. By the way, if you just tuned in, 60% off musketeerreport.com right now. If you want to sign up during this transfer portal news period, lots of information on the message board. Sign up, 60% off. It's less than four dollars a month. I mean, you can't get wait, wait, you can't get a sandwich, you can't get a coffee. Maybe get a fountain drink. Chipotle. Like, out your gas Chipotle. I just uh, sitting right here. Yeah, what'd that cost you? Twenty bucks now? God, eleven bucks for just a bowl. No chips, guac, drink, nothing. I didn't get anything else. It's just four dollars. It's four dollars. You guys can you guys can do it. Sign up now. Musketeerreport.com. Sixty percent off sale for transfer. 
Palooza. Palooza. Uh, we got guards. We got front court players. Um, I think we talked about most of the main targets, most of the guys that are going to be visiting this week. Is is there anything else? I mean, again, in case you missed it, in case you're just joining us, Ryan Conwell visited Sunday and Monday. John Hughley is currently on campus. He came uh, last night, Monday night. He is visiting all day today on Tuesday. And we believe Dan, uh, Dante Maddox will be on campus on Wednesday at Xavier. Those are the, the visits we have confirmed. Obviously, I'll update you on the message board if any of the other visits that could potentially happen are locked in and confirmed. Are there any other names specifically, Paul, or any other ideas that you wanted to get to before we start getting into fan questions here? No, I, I did have a few other notes to talk about um, that were not portal related. But um, as far as the portal goes, I think we checked all those boxes. Okay, good. Um, all right, so maybe we can go through some of these questions. If you guys have any more, feel free to to get them in here. Uh, what before we before we get to the questions, Rick? If you want to just roll through a couple of things here, um, the the only thing that we saw today, and, and this is a bigger point that I was going to make, was um, Sean talked on the podcast the other day about the scheduling and the non conference scheduling and the Gavit games and the Big Twelve Challenge going away, and today John Rothstein pointing out that Xavier's going to play Morgan State next year and I I say that not because so much it's big news that they're going to play Morgan State but more so looking at the schedule for next season that you have 11 games you have the two games in Fort Myers you have the Big 12 challenge in its final year the Gavit games are done you have the shootout and then from there maybe you add one more high major game or six or seven by games. And I think that's how it's going to be. And I know a lot of people were critical this year, myself included, of how the Big 12 handled things. And they went and they played a bunch of very easy teams in the non-conference. But hey, guess what? That's the era we're in right now that the data backs it up that if you just go and you can stack wins and you beat the crap out of teams in the non-conference, it's going to pay off once you get to the league schedule and you all start playing each other. Big 12 got a lot of teams in. I know the Big East only got three teams in. They had the national champion, but you do want to get as many teams into the tournament as you can. Sean made that point the other day on the podcast. He is very happy that the Big 12 Challenge and the Gavit Games are going away to give himself more control of the schedule. And I know that people listening to this that are inside the Xavier ticket office probably don't want me to say this two weeks before the seat selection process comes out. But my guess would be you probably see one of the weaker non-conference non-conference schedules this upcoming season that Xavier has played in recent years only because of how it's going right now. That's not necessarily a knock on Xavier. That's just how the sport is trending because the data backs it up. So I, I have a couple things here. One, I agree with Sean about losing the, the Big Ten and Big 12 challenges. They're, they're silly. They don't make sense in this era where you already have 20 game conference schedules that you're dictated you have to play to adding an, another couple of events. Like, okay, think about that. Those are two games that you have picked for you. Then you're going to play in an MTE where you don't have any control over who you're going to play after you've entered into it. And you've got the Crosstown Shootout game. So that's a lot of games now in your schedule. In addition to the 20 conference games, you have no control over. And every time we talk to Mario during one of these podcasts about the scheduling stuff, he always talks about the most important thing with scheduling is being able to control what day do you play on? What's going on around you when that happens? When's your next game? Where do you play? All of those things are very important to them. And when you play in these types of events, you lose control of them. I, I should I should say, I more so meant, yes, the non-conference will be weak, but specifically this coming year, weak at home. Because you're still going to get the two high major games in, in Fort Myers. You're still going to get the Big 12 game. You're still going to get the, you're going to get all those games we've talked about. So it's not like you're going to play... 11 cupcakes that's not going to happen you're not going to do you know like cincinnati last year where you're just playing xavier and dayton and then nine other cupcake teams that's not going to happen this year it's just that maybe you potentially get one high because cincinnati's on the road the big 12 game will be on the road the fort myers are the neutral games so as far as the non-conference goes my guess would be they add one high major home game and from there it's probably just by games now, as far as the whole like Big 12 manipulated the uh, advanced metrics and the net and all that to get all the teams in, um, I don't disagree that that's happening. Like you can manipulate Ken Palm and the net, the, the predictive metrics by beating up on bad teams and getting your offensive efficiency numbers way up or your defensive efficiency numbers way up. That is a thing. Beating bad teams by 40 or 50 points is definitely helping these teams' metrics. But explain to me this which Big 12 team that was on the bubble? 
made it into the tournament because of that. There is none. All, they, they don't have an answer to that. The, these coaches all keep talking about what the Big 12 did this year, but you know what the Big 12 did this year? They won a bunch of games. The teams that were in the tournament from the Big 12 were clearly in the tournament. The ones who were on the bubble, they actually got left out from the Big 12. I mean, the Big 12 didn't have teams on the bubble that got in because of this manipula manipulation of the net that everyone's referring to. So I'm not disagreeing that they did do that, but I don't see where there's clear evidence that it helped them it, it, when it came time, in fact, we've seen the opposite. Other teams that were either boosted with their seed line or they were on the bubble and they made it in, made it in because they won big games. I, I mean, the committee is very clear about winning big games on the road helps you. I'm, I'm not sure why everyone's takeaway, why all the coaches, and you're not wrong about that. Every coaching staff feels exactly what Everywhere you at like every, every level. Staff I've to. And they're saying it publicly. They're saying it privately. Like it's not just high major level. It's mid majors too. They're all saying, we're not going to schedule anybody this year. It doesn't do us any good. And I don't understand where they un where they got that takeaway from. I don't think it's accurate. I think it's an incorrect takeaway. Yeah, in the first two months of the season now, especially December, because November, at least, you have Feast Week. You have a lot of the exempt tournaments. But man, Rick, what is December going to look like across the sport? It's going to be bad, but I I'll tell you this. I shouldn't speak for Mario Mercurio, but I'm going to. We will get an answer from him about that. We'll have him explain this, why that's the takeaway, why teams are going to schedule softer going forward, if he feels that's the case. And I think he does feel that way. Um, but we will get him on the record to give him his opinion on why that happens, I, I think, because he, he usually does a podcast talking about scheduling with us during the offseason. So hopefully we'll be able to do that again this year. And I will ask him about that specific thing. Um, yeah, oh, sorry. Did you have anything else you want to get into before questions here? Yeah, I just think the only thing was the other thing that uh, – the other night, you know, Kentucky made their hire. Mark Pope is now the head coach at Kentucky. And if you look at the area coaches, I listed them out. I mean, Jake Diebler at Ohio State. You have Wes Miller at Cincinnati. You have Crazy. Sean Miller at Xavier. You have Mark Pope at Kentucky. You have Pat Kelsey at Louisville. You have Mike Woodson at Indiana. If you want to go a little higher, you know, farther north, you could go to Shrewsbury at Notre Dame and, and uh, Matt Painter at Purdue. But I kept it a little closer in here, tighter to this area in the Power Six. Power five now, RIP the Pac 12. I just, when you look at that list that Thad Mata at Butler and Sean Miller at Xavier, they're the only two with more than two tournament wins in this area. And it's they have both crazy. have 20 plus. It's crazy. I mean, these are big time programs. This is the hotbed of college basketball, all of those things that we always say about this area. And I think those are true. I think they apply. And then now look at the coaches in this area and it's like, Sean Miller, clearly at the top of that list. I mean, like you said, if you want to stretch a little bit, it's like Sean Miller and Thad Mata are, are kind of your coaches. I mean, I mean, Sean Miller and Thad Mata have a combined 45 wins in the tournament. Mike Woodson, Wes Miller, Mark Pope, Pat Kelsey, and Jake Diebler have two, and they're both from Mike Woodson. How about our, our guy, the great Charles Bronson, was texting me uh, about this. Which coach in the state of Kentucky now has the most NCAA tournament wins? Yeah, I got this one wrong. He uh, he sent me the same trivia question, and I got it wrong. I, I thought it was your boy, Darren Horn, but I, I forgot. When he said, I, it, to, when he said I, it to me, I assumed that's what it was, and then I thought about it for a second and realized I forgot Murray State existed. But Well, I just forgot who was at Murray State. So. I forgot I forgot they existed in the state of Kentucky. I, oh. I, I just went all the directional schools. I didn't think about Moorhead and Murray State initially, and then I was like, oh, wait, that's right, Steve Prom exists. So it's Steve Prom and then Darren Horn are the two leading NCAA tournament winners in the state of Kentucky right now. Yeah, that, that whole deal is just crazy. I'm fascinated to see how it all works out. And, I mean, let's face it. Pat Kelsey was a, a candidate, at least in some people's minds, for each of the last two times this Xavier job came open. So now to see him being at Louisville and getting his high major chance, that is going to be fascinating for the Xavier fan base because it's going to be a, either a what could have been or a glad it wasn't us scenario, right? And, I mean, fortunately for Xavier fans, it all worked out because you end up getting Sean Miller in the end anyways. All right, let me ask you a question. Just throw it, throw this out there. Who is Xavier more likely to play in the next five years? Charleston, Ohio State, Louisville, or Indiana in a high major game? Well, Charleston wouldn't be a high major game, so I would or, go with Charleston. Well, sorry, sorry. So I said I said high major, non conference. Okay. I would go Charleston. Okay. Because I think they would be most likely to do Mac that favor, even if they don't I mean Actually, I don't know. There's no chance they would invite Mac. I, I take that back. They would invite Mac to play Mac. That's what I mean. That's what I mean. Because it would have to be Mac coming to Cintas. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, that, sorry, that was stupid of me to say. That was a bad answer off the top. Because there's no um, way, there's no way they would put Mac in that situation to bring him back here, right? Wait, did, Maybe they would. D- does the Gavit game still? How many, how many, how many appearances do we have left in the Gavit games? Is there any chance they would throw Indiana or Ohio State against Xavier again in the Gavit games? Isn't it done? I thought it was done. <laughs> I think it is, but I was just saying, is there? Oh, oh I, I mean, I, I don't think any of these games are going to happen. Is my point, Paul? I, I'm trying to yeah. figure out a way that one of these could be the backdoor answer like, here. Does, does, does Kelsey a, maybe does Kelsey maybe want a game like that? But where would they play yeah. it? Both none of those three teams are doing a high major game with Xavier. If, I mean, that, it's never happened before. It's not going to happen now, and they've got a better coach than those schools. All right, just throwing it out there. All right, I, uh, I, I, I'd look. It's, it'd be a great opportunity if someone would do it but like none of those schools have been willing to play xavier when they've definitely thought they were better and superior to xavier they're sure as hell now not going to agree to it when they feel like sean miller is the better coach than what they have yeah uh all right let's uh let's get it out that yeah that was let's start off with this because i think this is worth addressing here doc says who is the most likely backup point guard makes total sense right like everyone's like hey we're looking at this guy where is he going to fit in or Hey, uh, if we get Dante Maddox, then what does this mean for so-and-so? Or who's the starting this? Who's the starting that? I I totally understand the interest in that. I totally understand that's part of the fun with that. And I expect you guys to talk about that until you're blue in the face and try to put together hypothetical lineups and rotations. I'm not going to be a lot of help in this right now for a few reasons. One, you don't want me to be. This is like when the when the coaches are talking to the recruits that they're bringing in, these transfers that they're, they're bringing in, a big part of that conversation and the leverage they have is, what role is that player going to be playing? If publicly we've gone out and as the main source of Xavier information, which I think is fair to say at this point, I'm going, this guy is going to be a backup before he's ever even taken his visit. How do you think that's going to work out for that kid and his family on the visit? Yeah. Probably not going to feel great about coming in here. So like, you don't really want me putting that out there about guys first and foremost. Second of all, I don't truthfully know all the time. Like, obviously I have some thoughts. Obviously I've talked to some people behind the scenes that, They've shared a few things with me of where they think something might be going, but this stuff changes so fast and they might be looking, they might be bringing in a guy like, oh yeah, in theory, this looks like the starter for now. Right. But in reality, they have intentions of like, we've still got $800,000 left of NIL after we're, we've completed the guys we need to get. We're going after another big time player at that position. So we don't know all the dominoes that are still to fall. So it's like the combination of not knowing the truth, the staff, not wanting the truth to be out there. And third, it's just not going to help anything. It's not going to help you guys. It's not going to help the team. It's it's going to be not beneficial for everyone involved. It's kind of going to limit how much I can really get into the roles of these guys before it's all set. Now, once we get done with the transfer portal and we have the roster and we kind of know what it's looking like or we get down to like the last guy or two and we know kind of who, who's going to be here, then we can absolutely start getting more into that. But for right now, like getting super specific about what everyone's role is, it's probably just not going to happen a lot. And I, I like, I'm sorry for that. I totally understand why you want that information. It's just, it's hard to do right now. Yep. All right. Um, how I'll, I'll let you answer this while I look for some more questions, Paul, how big of a deal is it for Xavier? If Ohio state and Louisville become in region powers again, to me, it would be a bigger deal if Louisville was only because Pat Kelsey is there. And I think he seems like, uh, seems to me like that would be a bigger deal to me because Louisville has been so bad now for so long. Um, just as far as I know they were number one under Max, so I don't want to necessarily say the encore. It just feels like they've kind of just been a program that needs to be completely turned around and gutted for a long time. I'm going to say that it would be a bigger deal to me if Louisville became a power because they have the staying power in basketball. Ohio State can come in waves with the football and everything else. I just think to me it would be to me it'd be a big deal if Pat Kelsey got Louisville right. I think I don't think it's a huge deal for Xavier either way, just because if you think about when Xavier made their climb through college basketball and really elevated their program, it was during a period when like all of the local regional powers were great. I mean, Kentucky was great. Louisville was great. Indiana's kind of faded away over the last decade plus, but like they had their moments, you know, going back a little bit longer when Xavier was really climbing. So I don't think it's really going to affect Xavier a whole lot. The the difference now is you are competing at the same level, so to speak, with all those other schools. So there is going to be a little more competition for uh, recruits and stuff like that. But for the most part, a lot of times, like Louisville and UK are kind of slotting in right there at the top for recruits, and Xavier's kind of in that next tier of guys. It's not a ton of overlap. So 
I think you pretty much nailed it. With Pat Kelsey, there may be a little bit more just because of his uh, preferences and who he likes to recruit and the regions he likes to recruit. But I don't think there's going to be a, a huge issue either way with that. And uh, honestly, I always love when the local teams are good. Like the region being better is, is good for college basketball. As somebody that does a show every single day on local college basketball, it's a tough go of it right now when everybody stinks. Yeah. I, so I, would, I, it totally would be nice that. if people could figure something out around here. They, they got to get it right for you. Off. Please, God, get better. Yeah. Multiple right, high level jobs. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ahead. This is a good question from Brian here. Go ahead. Multiple high level jobs open and Miller stayed. What would you guess are top five that he would leave for? Oh, that is a good question. Yeah. Right? No, to be clear, I don't have a list of top five jobs Sean would leave yeah. for. I have no idea at this point. Um, the first time he was here, Maryland was always mentioned as the job to be on the lookout for. And then Maryland apparently like screwed it up incredibly bad during their hiring process at one point when it came open. And so I don't know if like one day that would be back in play for Sean. I mean, the sport has changed so much since then too, that I don't even know a job like Maryland specifically, but lots of jobs now, if those would still be the dream jobs that they were then. Um, and to be quite honest with you, I think Sean's situation has probably changed a lot since the first time he was at Xavier. I don't know how many quote unquote dream jobs are really out there anymore for a guy like Sean. He's been to the peak. He hasn't gotten his final four championship yet, but he's coached at as high of a level as you can coach. He's gotten as much money as you can have. He's he's done all the all the high level coaching things that you can do. He's done. So now it's more a matter, I think, for him of just getting that final four and championship and enjoying your life as much as possible. And the fact that you went through Ohio State and Kentucky this year, those are if you were to tell me, make a list right now, gun to your head, you have to come up with top five jobs Sean would leave for. Those are in my top three. Both of them. Those would have been in my top three before this year. So that's a big deal that he didn't take either one of those. If you think about everything that's happened in the last four years for Xavier, and I, I kind of posted this on the message board, but even since I posted that, where when I was talked about it in the last week of March, where, you know, back on March 1st of 2018, Xavier was getting ready for the number one seed, and you had Chris Mack at Xavier. And now all of a sudden, five years, six years later, Chris Mack is at Charleston, Pat Kelsey's at Louisville, Sean Miller is at Xavier. If you think about even what's happened in the last three weeks since then, that the coaching carousel has really wrapped up, and the fact that Xavier had their worst season in my lifetime, and it comes on the heels of Ohio State, Michigan, Kentucky, and Louisville all opening in the same offseason, in the offseason after Xavier goes 16 and 18, like all of these dominoes that keep falling for Xavier and happening when they happen. I mean, if you flip it, right? If you think to yourself that Xavier goes, it let's let me back up. If you said, Paul, Xavier goes, uh, Xavier hires Sean Miller and goes 16 and 18 at one point in the next couple of seasons, you go, Oh, well, obviously it's their first season because there's roster turnover in the portal. No, Xavier went to the sweet 16 in their first season under Sean and then went 16 and 18 the next year because a couple of injuries and accidents and everything happened. And now all of a sudden, you don't lose your coach to any of these schools in the coaching carousel. Not that, not to say that he would have left for those schools anyway. I, I have no idea. But I'm just saying, probably when you think to yourself, what are the schools in the area that come to mind if you get nervous? Every single one of those schools open, and Sean Miller is still your head coach. I don't know what more you could have asked for as far as timing goes. Let's face it. You're way more worried. Way more worried about that Kentucky job the last few weeks. If Xavier's coming off a sweet 16 this year, way more. I mean, it's a totally different ball. Cause I mean, to be quite honest, Kentucky just wasn't going to look at Sean Miller this year. The fan base wasn't interested in it and the big donors weren't on board. I heard there was like one or two people behind the scenes that were pushing for Sean felt he was the best coach available, but that Mitch Barnhart really never had any interest. And I mean, like, like you said, the, the timing of it, just worked out so perfectly for Xavier fans, even though you had to suffer through a bad year. If this was going to be the year where it was a down year for you, this is the year you wanted. The year that Ohio State and Kentucky were both going to come open. And Ohio State didn't seem like it mattered because they ended up just going with the, the interim guy anyway in Diebler. But with Kentucky, you would have been way more worried about what was about to play out if Xavier was coming off a successful NCAA tournament run. So, yeah, that's crazy. Now, in terms of the jobs, I mean, well, we just go... Kansas, Carolina, 
Duke? I mean, like, no, I, I don't know. I'm not even going to. It's the yeah. best of the best right now at this point, right? Or the perfect fit. I mean, the, the landscape has changed in college basketball. So there are reasons that Sean may just decide, look, like, this is hard as hell to win at Xavier with the way the transfer portal and NIL works now. Like, I don't want to do this at some point, but I, I don't think we're anywhere near that point right now. And I think he's invigorated. I think he is excited about what they have going on at Xavier and, and building this thing going forward. So um, if I'm a Xavier fan, the whole coaching carousel would really have me fired up with the way it played out this year. Th this is like, this is sort of the dream as a Xavier fan. This is the best chance you've ever had by far of keeping a big time coach for the long term. And I don't know what the long term means. I don't know how much longer Sean wants to coach, but like I feel pretty confident. Like if you gave me Sean Miller is going to be at Xavier over or under nine and a half years, I'm taking the over without a doubt. That that's job security right there. <laughs> Shout out to the Sean Miller podcast. Shout out the pod. That's awesome. Uh, if Sean and staff continue to target a bunch of grad transfers with one year left, are you worried about this becoming a revolving door every year? Um, I think we're already there. I think it's already a revolving door every year, Matt. That's just the way the sport's going to work. Now, hopefully you're not in the situation where like seven guys are leaving every year. Hopefully it's more like three, four, something like that, I think. Um, but I think it's just kind of the way it is. I think the way to win in college basketball is to get as old as possible now. That doesn't mean you won't look for a couple – like Ryan Conwell, who they're recruiting right now, has two years of eligibility. So they're definitely going to look for guys with multiple years of eligibility. And long-term, as NIL continues to mature and get more sophisticated and you start to get different types of offers coming in, I think you'll start to see maybe like at some point, maybe these guys will become employees. Maybe it won't be NIL contracts from donors, but it'll be co our collectives, but it'll come actually from the school. And in that case, maybe they will be signing like – a two-year deal for X amount of money. When that stuff starts to happen, it'll be a little bit different. But for right now, again, I wouldn't get too caught up in the revolving door thing because that's kind of how you do it right now. That's kind of how you win. Get old, stay old, and, and keep bringing in more talent. Does the portal make recruiting incoming freshmen basically useless now? If we have to rebuild the entire roster every year, then what are we really doing? Well, uh, kind of the same point there. I, I think that this is how you win in college basketball. That's what you're doing. And does the portal make recruiting incoming freshmen basically useless now? I don't think so, but it does change the emphasis significantly on recruiting freshmen because especially in a, a team like Xavier, who's not getting a lot of one and done type talents, I don't see freshmen in this current era of basketball making a big impact at all. I, and I don't see that. I don't see you spend a lot of NIL money to get them. I'd see them as sort of putting them on the back burner. Now, at the same time, if you look at how UConn has created their dynasty that they created, it involves a couple of really good freshman recruits. Alex Caravan, Donovan Klingon, Stefan Castle. Like Those are all big-time UConn recruits that they brought in as freshmen. So I think it pays to do both. You want to try to bring in these high upside freshmen. Maybe you find the diamond in the rough. Or maybe like for in Z Xavier history, if we're looking at it, like, what if you were able to bring in a Trayvon Blue and a J.P. Makira while also having this older team that's ready to compete right away and place with them? Could be great, right? Now, maybe those guys leave after a year, get more NIL money in the current climate. But I think that is how you win in today's climate. So you don't forget about freshman recruiting, but it's definitely on the back burner a little bit. Yep. Paul, any thoughts there? Or keep no, rolling? no, nothing to add. Keep rolling. All right. Uh, it's not, if you see anything you want to jump in there with, because I'm, I'm still back with little ways. If there's anything new that you see that's good, go ahead and throw uh, it up there. I can't put it up, but I... I don't see anything we haven't really already addressed. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't see anything. Yeah, I saw that we a lot haven't... of people mentioning Kentucky throughout this thing. I'm not sure why. Um, not right now. There, there aren't any Kentucky targets. I, I don't anticipate that there really will be. Uh. Yeah, I don't see anything. Dan asked thoughts on whether we continue to recruit heavy internationally. I guess. I do think international will continue to be a part of the piece. Now, last year was heavy because that was the only option after Zach and Jerome went down, right? Like the transfer portal wasn't open anymore. There are some bad freshmen left if you wanted some bad freshmen, but they tried to go and, and get international guys. Hopefully they had a little more experience, a little bit more of a maturity playing basketball and, it just didn't work out. So you won't see a situation like last year where they scrambled at the last minute for 
multiple foreigners. Um, but I do think you'll continue to see them recruit internationally as part of their strategy. Sure. Um, you know, I, I did see a couple of questions. Everybody keeps putting out these way too top or way too early top 25 or the Big East rankings and everything else. I'm not going to get into all of that, but I will say just with the targets that Xavier is going after right now, you're able to land a couple of those. You bring Des Claude back with Zach Fremantle and Jerome Hunter, and you look at all of the talent that is exiting the Big East, guys that are either going to the draft or have used up their eligibility or might be entering the transfer portal. I'm not going to get ahead of myself here on April 16th, but I am going to say Xavier has a serious chance in the Big East next year if they can land a couple of these these big time guys that they feel pretty good about. Yeah, definitely. Paul, uh, re responding to what I was saying before about like UConn building roster, he said UConn didn't recruit mercenaries either. Well, what's Camp Spencer? Yeah. Like, what do we mean by mercenaries? Like, they're definitely recruiting transfer portal guys. They're definitely recruiting just one year transfer portal guys. So, I mean, it's a blend. Ideally, you get a blend of really talented recruits, have some guys in place that maybe are a couple of year transfers that you can build with, a la their point guard situation, and then hopefully you land a stud in the transfer portal that's an immediate impact guy like Cam Spencer too. Um, I think that is pretty much it. How much NIL money does it take to really land a five-star highly recruited player? Uh, it depends. If you're talking about straight out of high school, freshman, less. If you're talking about a top transfer in the portal, over a million dollars, it appears this year. I mean, that, that seems to be the going rate for guys that are at the top of the list in the transfer portal there. They're over a million. It seems like a lot of guys that are kind of the stars of college basketball, the, the bona fide high major starters, they're like 700 ish, 700 ish thousand. So I actually have a, a post I'm going to put up on musketeerreport.com, I think later today, uh, that has some. A few NIL insights. I don't, I don't want to tease it up too much, overhype it, but uh, a, a couple of things that you guys might find interesting in, in terms of how Xavier's paying their players and, and what guys are getting. So again, sign up for musketeerreport.com. It's 60% off right now, less than $4 a month. Musketeerreport.com, transfer Palooza sale, 60% off. Paul, the new episode of the Sean Miller podcast is out. It's See, I like these podcasts actually better than the guest podcast. I know most of the fans are going to disagree. They like the big name guests. I'd much rather just have you two sit in and talk to Sean and get as much nuggets out of Sean as you can and, and listen to him talk basketball than the interviews with former players that, I mean, some of it's good, but I don't care about it as much. The stuff from Sean is usually great. And this was another good one. Yeah, it was funny. I mean, this was, Sean was incredibly busy this week. So we were glad we were able to get this in, especially after the last couple of weeks where, you know, he's been on the road or things have been going on that we haven't been able to talk to him. So we were able to sneak this one in last Thursday and between, it was really like four parts where he talked about UConn and how dominant UConn was. Uh, he talked about the scheduling, the big 12 challenge and the Gavit games told a fantastic story about a goldfish he had in college and then some other things kind of sprinkled in there too. Can I ask about the goldfish story real quick? Sure. Like what, what was, so I might understand that he bought a goldfish, put it in a bowl and then just stared at it every day. Is that what was going on? I think it was just a constant reminder of Mookie Blaylock. Yeah. Like he just, <laughs> he fed it. It was just like, I'm just, I'm just thinking about Mookie every day. And then the poor little goldfish died. So he got Mookie too. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to like figure out the, uh, the I did or why that worked, but it, Clearly to him, I, it made I, sense. I got a request last night for Sean Miller podcast goldfish merch. So maybe that's got, maybe, maybe we create a line of that. That actually would sell. I mean, it's already got, yeah, Paul is bringing the point up that I was going to bring. It's already got a little bit of the buzz from Ted Lasso, right? That's a big thing from Ted Lasso. Everyone talks about goldfish from that. I don't yeah, watch it. I, I haven't watched Ted Lasso in like three years. So I had forgotten about that. And then as soon as I started seeing the gifs of people replying, I was like, oh yeah, that too. So, uh, yeah, maybe, maybe that's on the way. Who knows? But, uh, it was, uh, yeah, that was a fun show. I, I do really like, I'm the same way as you, Rick, where I very much enjoy sitting there and just having a conversation, talking to him. Uh, we obviously do have a bunch of guests that we're going to bring on um, and, and do throughout the off season. But yeah, yeah to, be clear, I, I thought, to be clear, that wasn't a shot at your guys' guest interviews. You do a great job with no, those no, no. two. And John's yeah. actually a really good interviewer himself. But just from my personal selfishness, oh, yeah. I want more information from Sean personally. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah that's that's really that for awesome me. anything else coming up uh in your world or have people on the lookout for sean miller podcast uh world? no i don't think so nothing huge to tease there um just really into college baseball season now as far as uh as far as the xavier stuff goes and then doing everything here so awesome yeah. uh i did see that i know there are other questions out there things that we already talked about earlier in the show for people that are just chiming in um 
Some of you have other stuff out there that you want asked, really specific stuff that probably isn't the best for this. Musketeerreport.com right now. Go on the message board. I'll reply to you immediately. I'm going to be on there the rest of the afternoon. It's 60% off, less than $4 a month. Just sign up and you can ask me all these questions. I'll answer you uh, individually. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, it, was a, it was a pocket tweet, but someone sent this to me and I, I like their explanation for it. Uh, Sean wasn't alone. Mm. Sean wasn't alone. Someone sent me those screenshots back to back. I thought that was pretty good. Leave it at that. Sean wasn't alone. Did you see? Well, no, I mean, I already posted on the message board what, I know. what the Sean wasn't alone thing was about. So I know. Uh, I thought that was pretty good. Uh, uh, okay. We got one other thing. Paul, can you give us commitment to staying with the Sean Miller podcast before the May 1st transfer deadline? You're Are hearing you, it publicly. Are you going to stay? You're back. You're hearing from me right now, live on the air. I am committed to the Sean Miller podcast and Adam Baum and Anthony Breen for the long term future. There you have it, folks. Yet, Perfect way to it. end today's show. Thank you, Paul. Absolutely. Thanks, Rick. Thanks for everybody for tuning in. Talk to you soon.